episode five, Wound Care in the Military Setting. We're back with the Wound Masterclass podcast and joining us on t- today's podcast is Lieutenant Colonel Stephen Jeffrey from the British Army and we've got Dr Eliza Lee who is a podiatrist in the Veterans Association. Today's podcast is kindly supported by Keresis. Episode five is going to cover managing wounds in the military environment going to be spending the next half an hour talking about the types of military injuries, the unique challenges faced in the military setting and essentially initial wound management. What are the main principles? We'll talk a little bit about secondary reconstruction considerations in prolonged field care. And then we'll also talk about the most important topic, the significance of providing care to veterans with combat related defects of the limbs. Modern warfare, unfortunately, has a diverse array of injuries encompassing gunshot wounds, blast injuries, burns and shrapnel wounds. With each of these types of injuries and mechanism, there are some set characteristics and complexities associated with each injury type. And it's also important to analyse the actual impact of those military injuries on the overall health and well-being of service members. Blast injuries are really common in military settings and they can cause a a wide range of injuries. Primary blast injuries occur when there's a direct effect of that blast wave on the body leading to injuries of airfield organs such as the lungs, eardrums and GI tract. Secondary blast injuries can result from flying debris or fragments propelled by that secondary wave. A tertiary blast injury is when individuals are thrown by that force of the explosion resulting in an impact related injury and quaternary blast injuries encompass all other injuries caused indirectly by the blast such as burns inhalational injuries and psychological trauma burns in the military setting are sustained due to a number of factors Uh, we can have explosions fires chemical agents and electrical sources and burns can range in severity from the superficial to deep dermal to full thickness burns and could be classified based on the thickness and also percentage of the body surface area affected. I don't know if you've met uh, Dr. Lee, Prof. Jeffrey. I don't think, no. no, we haven't. Hi. Hi. Dr. Lee uh, works in the VA system, Veterans Affairs in uh, the US in Virginia. And Prof. Jeffrey is one of the leading military um, wound care doctors here in the UK. So. Oh, nice. Yeah, I was wondering. So you're a lieutenant colonel? Yeah, well, I'm re- I'm, I'm, I'm retired from um, the regulars. I'm now just in the reserves. Okay. Yeah. Right. I, did my, I did my 35 years active duty, and now I'm, I get, I'm just drawing the pension. <laughs> well, <laughs> still, I get, still in the reserves, so, because um, I like, you know, for teaching and all that, kind of theory, you could get deployed again. In theory, you're kind of like a veteran, then, right? So, I'm a bit. Yeah, yeah. That's right. I don't know how their hospital systems are over there, but we have a huge system for veterans. Do you guys have the same? No, we don't, because we all, all our medicine in the UK is socialized anyway. So you so just I, go into the yeah. civilian war, uh, yeah. world. Yeah. Got it. So welcome to Wound Care in the Military Setting. This is episode five of the Wound Masterclass podcast, and I'm delighted to be joined by our global panel today, uh, which is basically Lieutenant Colonel Jeffrey, who's joining us from the United Kingdom, and we've got Dr. Eliza Lee joining us from the VA system in Virginia. Um, So welcome to you both. Thank you for joining us for this podcast. Hello. Hello. We're really excited to spend the next little time with you both learning about military um, setting wound care, uh, essentially both within obviously United Kingdom and the US. Um, So delighted to have you here to discuss this really important topic, which is a topic that unfortunately a lot of time isn't dedicated to. So I thank you both and let us start. So can I just come to you first, Lieutenant Colonel? Professor Jeffrey, you tell us a little bit about you know, your military background. I'm a, a bachelor plastic surgeon, and I um, recently retired from the regular army after doing my uh, full career, 35 years, um, and now I'm in the uh, army reserves. And um, my interests are all aspects of uh, wound healing. 
Fantastic. Uh, and let's come over to you, Dr. Lee. Yes. So I work in the Veterans Health Administration, and I've been there at our facility for about 10 years now, three years as a resident. And I like clinical research, love wound care, and all things about wounds. It's really my focus as well. That's great. So let's have, let's start the discussion by just talking about military injuries and why we should be thinking about them in a slightly different way to general wound care. Uh, military wounds are uh, are different from civilian use wounds, mostly in the sort of uh, extent of the wounds and in the degree of contamination uh, associated uh, with the wounds. Um, so they 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 represent quite a challenge, much more of a challenge than a, than a, a civilian type injury. Even even a, something like a gunshot wound, which in in uh, I know in America at least is is pretty common wound, um, civilian wound. But in in a military setting, it's a lot. It's, it's a higher higher caliber um, weapon that's often used, and the degree of contamination. Um, is a lot uh, more extensive. For example, the soldier is unlikely to have just stepped out of the shower than if he had been shot in New York, say. Um, he's likely to have been wearing the same clothes for about a week, and he'll be heavily contaminated, and those clothes will get driven into the um, into the wound and, and will um, uh, start the infection process. Secondly, if you get a civilian wound, usually... You're going to get seen pretty quickly, um, taking families to a nice, clean hospital, and you're going to get state-of-the-art uh, treatment. Where in the military setting, there are a whole lot of barriers to that um, smooth process. Um, you might still be getting fired upon while you while you're trying to treat your wound or your buddy's wound, and then um, the the evacuation chain. Um, although um, we were very lucky in the We've been very lucky in the last 20 years or so with the evacuation chain from, say, Iraq and Afghanistan back to Europe and, and um, to the US. You know, we've, we've had um, unfettered use of helicopters and airplanes. So we've, that, that, that um, evacuation chain has been a, sort of a bit, has been very, very um, quick. Um, but, um, you know, in future conflicts, I think we might. Uh, go back to a more um, situation and more akin to what happened in the First World War when the, the evacuation, chain, evacuation chain was very prolonged and that meant that people are getting were essentially being stuck uh, without getting um, access to the standard of care. And so what, what we want to do for any when any serviceman gets injured, we want to offer them the gold standard of care that we would offer if they were injured in their home nation. Um, but um, you know that we're going to talk about a number of the barriers that um, that will um, prevent that from happening. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we were to talk about sort of um, principles of initial wound management, which we'll touch upon during this podcast, are we in terms of the first line facilities that we're we're looking at? What kind of setup do we do we usually have in that sort of very initial wound management stage? In that military setting, typically, well, well the, where the guy gets injured, that's going to be obviously by definition, that's going to be in the hot zone. So you know, um, he, he's been injured by um, enemy fire or um, or a device or or uh, such. Um, so our soldiers are trained to give themselves first aid and to give their buddies first aid. Um, obviously, the the resources that they have. Um, in terms of terms of the wound, are fairly limited. Um, the, the priority at this stage really is about keeping them alive. So it's about hemorrhage control, etc. Um, in terms of what will happen to the wound is that uh, the, there are hemostatic agents that can be can be utilised to put into into the wound if there's torrential um, bleeding. But you, essentially, an, an Israeli type bandage that's a sort of a bandage has got an absorptive capacity is going to be put onto the wound, and then this is going to be um, applied with um, circumferentially around to keep it in place. Um, the, and then also, they'll, they'll they'll be given some some form of um, um, analgesia if, if required. 
Um, and then it's a case of getting them back to somewhere where they can get some uh, definitive, well, not, not definitive, they can get some um, damage control uh, surgery for the wound. And the principles of the, of the actual wound management are um, you know, once, they, once they get to a facility where a wound can be debrided, so, you know, obviously that requires a surgeon and an anaesthetist and the ability to give an anaesthetic. Um, the, the principles are to debride the wound, stabilise any fractures, uh, preserve and, and repair any uh, nerves or blood vessels that have been damaged, and, and then get them back to somewhere, to a role four, either in Europe or in the US, for the definitive, definitive treatment. And, and this is, uh, this is um, all happening while the patient has been resuscitated. And, and this process called um, damage control surgery about where you, you you're, it's a surgery to allow resuscitation. Right. And when, and when you, when, and the, the wound debridement, you know, we're obviously focusing our, our podcast here on the wound elements of things. So I'm assuming that the patient is alive and they've got a wound. Um, so it, what, is, what is the surgeon's job or the clinician's job is, is, is to um, prevent further tissue loss. They've, they've already lost some of their tissue, you know, by the either the, uh, the gunshot wound or the shrapnel or the blast injury has, has um, already deprived some tissue. We try to minimise the further tissue loss. So when you do your debridement, you were talking about doing a marginal debridement, not a radical debridement. And then we, what we we try to prevent further tissue loss by preventing infection, subsequent wound infection, and preventing desiccation desiccation of the tissues. Yeah, I mean, I that paper that you wrote, so I think it was about 2016, 2017, I thought really summarized it really well in terms of looking at um, the debridement as, as a completely different ball game to the debridement that we would do in normal wound practice. And I think we'll come to that a little bit when we're talking about the mechanisms of, of military injuries as well. Um, and then we're hoping to discuss a little bit about secondary reconstruction uh, in terms of prolonged field care in that sort of setting. What are the challenges? What are the solutions that we can provide? And then we're going to come uh, to Dr. Lee a little bit to talk about providing care to veterans uh, in the long term kind of setting. So um, you've sort of touched on this a little bit, uh, Professor Jeffrey, talking a little bit about sort of gunshot wounds and obviously contamination. But similarly, I suppose in terms of blast injuries, burns and shrapnel wounds, these are kind of the array of injuries, it seems, that uh, you would have dealt with uh, in in your capacity and essentially we'll be talking a little bit about the impact of military injuries on overall health including mental health long-term suicide risk um, and all the other challenges that are maybe not um, evident in in those early stages of, of wound management um, so the type of conflict also has a bearing um, isn't that right so you, I think uh, Prof Jeffrey you talked a little bit about how type of conflict may be changing in the future if we look at different types of wars in the future, whereas before perhaps World War, it may have been um, direct combat, whereas now we're very much into the era of kind of drone attacks. I mean, it's something probably an area I don't know much about, but I'd be interested to kind of hear your perspective on uh, essentially where you think we should be kind of looking in terms of the future of skills we might need to have. Well, certainly, Jimmy, the type of conflict, conflict does um, give you different types of injuries. So, um, you know, if it's a primary a land battle, obviously, um, naval um, injuries are going to give you a lot more burns. They get a lot of flash burns, etc. Um, tank injuries also, so tank uh, warfare will give you a lot more uh, burns. Um, the obviously we we can't plan for what what type <laughs> type of war the next type of war is going to be, but I think um, the the Ukraine experience um, is is unfortunately um, giving people um, an idea of what the the, ne the next major war might look like from a NATO point of view. 
Yeah. And we'll touch a little bit about other factors as well in terms of the mechanism. So we'll just, shall we start just briefly touching on ballistic trauma? Obviously, this is the type of injury caused by impact of projectiles, uh, can in include shrapnel and fragments in the wounds, uh, blast injuries, a little bit you touched upon, explosions can be primary blast injuries, a secondary blast, tertiary and quartery blast injuries as well. Um, and obviously burns makes up a, a, a significant part of um, your treatment as a as a military wound uh, specialist. So um, musculoskeletal injuries, I think, uh, Dr. Lee, you're going to talk a little bit about uh, obviously the long-term rehab and types of injuries that can cause veterans problems in the decades to come as well uh, during the podcast. Great. So uh, shall we start talking a little bit about uh, the sort of initial wound care um, in terms of these kind of factors, the critical steps, uh, establishing contamination, uh, the debridement we've talked about a little bit. How about hemorrhage control? Dr. Lee, you've got some experience in using some Kitasan products in, in the settings where you're doing debridement. Yes, and it does not compare to the battlefield, of course. Um, I do have some experience with that, especially in the anticoagulation patient population. And the, they're really fantastic, um, quick control, regardless of any hemostatic agents that they are or anticoagulation medicines that they might be on. But in the battlefield, right, that shouldn't be an issue. It's quick, stop them from bleeding and, and get them going. Um, to the, the next place. And Dr. Jeffrey already kind of touched on that for us here. Um, Just following ATLS principles, essentially. Essentially. Yeah. But the products are amazing and they're fantastic. Great. Um, so let's talk a little bit. Let's come down now to um, Professor um, Jeffrey talk a little bit about secondary reconstruction. So would you like to start on this on this <laughs> hefty topic? It's, it's quite a big one. But, uh, I think we yeah the the um second the, the reconstruction um phase starts with a stable patient so um we because we have a, a a concept called um, delayed primary closure um uh, where or delayed closure of the wound and why do we why do we cause a delay surely delay will be a bad thing but actually delay if you try and close a wound too soon. Um, it, it'll end in tears, uh, both yours and the patient's, uh, because there's um, if there's any residual contamination in the wound, uh, that will be you're closing that in. Also, we know that um, wounds progress with time. There is an extension of the tissue necrosis for some reason, um, we're not, which we're not entirely sure about. But for example, if you have a blast injury. The whole of your um, body is going to be exposed to the blast, not just the not just the injured limb. Say, you know, everything from head to toe is going to have that primary blast wave go through it, and um, the little blood vessels in your body, um, some of them get sheared, where they, where they where the blood vessel goes from an area of being relatively mobile. To being relatively fixed, where it joins, where it perforates the fascia, for example, at that point, it can be, there can be shearing of the, the blood vessel and damage to the intermarbon blood vessel. Um, so the, the the blood supply um, um, is problematic after after blast injury. So um, don't don't um, wait until the the patient is physiologically stable enough to get their wound closure and that you've done all the debridement and do not um, mix up debridement and closure. Don't, don't do those at the same time. You really need to do your debridement, wait until the patient's stable, then do your closure. And then, so what closure um, techniques are available? Well, we have um, a, a, a plethora of techniques available uh, to the any reconstructive surgeon, we talk about a reconstructive ladder, which is um, starts with the simplest procedures and, and becomes more complicated as, as time goes on. Um, simplest procedure, obviously, would be to leave the wound to, to heal on its own. And that is appropriate. It's a very small wound. Um, and then going up to closing the wound primarily and then skin grafting and then flaps and pre-flaps, etc. 
Um, generally speaking, the the, um, the higher up the reconstructed ladder you get, you get more potential for a nicer result. But the, the um, there is also more potential for things to go wrong, and they tend to take longer. So, for example, a three flap operation is what's usually required when you've got an open fracture. Um, certainly in the military context, say uh, um, say someone's having a gunshot wound to the tibia and they through the through the tibia. Um, and they're having that reconstructed. That will usually require a three flap, um, and that's great. And that'll give you a good result. However, one of the issues is the time that it takes to do that, because it'll take six to eight hours to do that surgery. Now, if you're in a in a normal civilian setting, that's absolutely fine because everyone's got the time to do that. But if you're in a situation where there are hundreds, if not thousands, of casualties, then um, you're going to have to. Um, Think about uh, making sure that you don't spend too much of your resources in terms of theatre time um, on um, on one patient. Um, where are the real bottlenecks in terms of um, uh, military surgery? Well, the lack of uh, theatre time um, in the field in a field hospital setting is very uh, very precious. There's there's um, uh, there's not exactly an uh, excess of theatre time theater with um, surgeons, etc. And the other thing that is also a, a, a critical resource is the use of blood, because the amount of blood that's going to be available um, in a field hospital is, is um, very limited. So um, if you're in a, in a resource poor environment, so for example, as, it, as is what's happening in Ukraine at the moment, where they have a lot of casualties and not a great deal of medical resources. Um, unfortunately, their requirements are going to be different from if you're getting, um, you know, a hospital in the in the UK or the US or in Europe gets you know single digit numbers of patients to deal with a week, then they can deal with that easily. But if you're having to deal with thousands a week, then you have to um, change your your mindset so that you're doing um, the the best for the for the most. Right. And in terms of uh, obviously setting up for flap type procedures, um, are you more doing sort of pedicled flaps rather than doing, obviously, presuming you don't have that microsurgical setup? Um... You well, you would, you would hopefully, you, the ideal scenario is, well, <laughs> the absolutely ideal scenario is that we're at peace and we're not at war, nobody gets injured. Um, Okay, so let's accept you're going to get injured. The best case scenario is that they they get they get you get um, you have air supremacy or air superiority, and you um, are able to do damage control surgery in the field hospital, and then you can evacuate them back stateside or to Europe for their definitive closure, and you can spend all the time you want doing their reconstruction, that, and that's great. Um, but we in future conflicts we might not have such, uh, we might not have had air security and uh, therefore we're not going to have the ability to transport our patients back um, in the time frame that we're used to. So we might be left with them stuck at the field hospital level. Mm -hmm. So that there's this, uh, this, this is where you need to start thinking about are there other things that can help. So for example, um, the with burn surgery, we know that if someone has a full thickness burn, the best thing to do is to excise that full thickness burn in the first few days, certainly within the first five days. And why do we do that? And that's because of the risk of infection. Because de dead tissue, but dead skin is a great source of infection, and infection is the number one killer uh, following a burn injury. So that's what we do in the civilian world. That's great, because we, in the civilian world, we can do skin grafting, and we can do can, if there's not enough skin graft, we can use what's called aloe graft, which is cadaveric skin graft. Um, and we can use that all we want, all day long, um, because we've got refrigeration. This needs to be kept frozen. Um, in, in, in a, uh, and also the other thing we've got in the civilian setting, we've got blood. If I want to use 20 units, 100 units of blood, that's fine. Um, in the military setting, if you're in a field hospital, you haven't got anything that's refrigerated because that's not going to work in the field, in the 
in the in the distribution chain, something that has to be um, kept at minus twenty five degrees is is not going to be not going to survive. Um, also, um, you're not going to have access to loads of blood. You, the the, the um, so your, your ability to do the excisional surgery, which is very very bloody surgery, um, is going to be limited. So that means that basically um, you're going to be saying to the patient, or you you know you're going to be admitting to yourself that you're going to be giving this patient less than the standard of care. So ways around that. So for example, um, there's products such as the um, the Keras's uh, fish skin product, which were, which uh, is a instead of being from a cadaver, this is um, skin that's come from a fish, um, and um, it doesn't need to be um, stored stored uh, stored frozen. It comes off the shelf, you know, freeze dried. So it's um, that's what you need. A, you need something that's some that can be kept at room temperature, that's light, robust, and easy to use. Such as um, the Kevin is. This will allow the surgeon to put on um, to do the um, uh, burn excision without having to use the the um, any allograft. It's also useful for um, down. Um, Downplaying or down, downsizing the complexity of the reconstruction. So, for example, you've got something you've got, and I've used this personally um, in uh, combat settings where you've got a patient that really should have a free, free flap, uh, but there's just no, there is no way that's going to happen because of your, the, the, the uh, limited resources available to you. Where if you can put on something like uh, 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 biological dressing like Gerasis, which will um, encourage uh, wound granulation, prepare the wound bed, and then that can allow you to get away with doing simple skin graft surgery rather than um, the, the the six to eight hour uh, free flap operation, which um, you, would not be possible to do. So essentially, because obviously it's fish skin technology, presumably then the, the vi there's no viral risk either in terms of products being... That's uh, right. Well, the, the, the reason one of the problems with allograft, allograft, so that means coming from another human. Autograft is from yourself, allograft from another dead human, obviously, hopefully dead. Um, then um, the, the risk is that there's viral transmission because you don't know, is that donor, did he have hepatitis, AIDS, whatever. Um, so to, to try and reduce that risk, what they do is they really heavily process um, the skin um, so that there's not only no viruses, but no prions, because, you know, you're also worry about mad cow and things like this. Um, it's heavily processed, so that it's safe and safe for humans to use. That's great. Um, so it turns out with fish, there are no viruses that um, can, that affect fishes that can um, be transferred to humans. So you can't get mad cod disease, for example. Um, so the... the um, the processing that is required to denature all that viruses um, is much much less. So um, the the um, the fish skin comes to you, and it actually still smells of fish. <laughs> it's a bit it's a bit funny the first time you use it because it, it really does smell of fish. Um, but that is a good sign to me because as well as um, retaining um, the physical. Uh, structures of skin because it's been treated very lightly. It also um, retains a lot of the um, growth factors, etc., and also fatty acids such as the omega three fatty acids, uh, which are uh, present in fish skin. They um, uh, are thought to be anti-inflammatory, and certainly um, they um, the get a, a reduction in pain immediate reduction in pain in patients that are, are using this. So I think the anti-inflammatory side is is quite important. And are you typically using them mainly on limbs? I mean, am, I, am I right in thinking that, obviously, because of body armour technology over the years, there's maybe less trunk injuries and more sort of extremities? Is that kind yes, of... Yes, that's, that, that's great. You know, it's always a battle, isn't it, um, between, body, between protection and, and the ability to move. Um, so the trunk uh, is relatively well protected and the chest and the abdomen and the head. Uh, so the, the, the areas that are left, well, there's the neck, 
unfortunately, not many people that have a significant injury to the neck live. Uh, the, you know, I've, I've, I've seen plenty of people live after a gunshot wound to the neck, but they've been the lucky few. But, you know, the, the bullet has managed to sort of weave its way between the vital structures uh, somehow. So um, the, then you've got the limbs, where obviously it'd be great to be able to put them in Kevlar and, and protect them in that way, but then the, the soldier wouldn't be able to run and um, therefore wouldn't be a very good soldier because what, what we really need the soldier to do is to is to win the firefight, and you can't do that if your limbs are encased in Kevlar. Um, so, yes, um, the the days of um, lots of open abdomens are luckily uh, over, mostly it's limb injuries, and mostly, unfortunately, the lower limb, um, a lot of, it's a lot of amputations. Mm. Uh, and for the patients, so for the, the soldiers that you're treating with sort of technology that you discussed is that typically after you'll do an initial debridement and then you'll apply this technology as a sort of temporizing um kind of stage before grafting or exactly exactly you the debridement has to happen no matter what technology you're going to put on that is the absolute key that they, it's done by someone that's um uh, experienced in debriding and the, the problem with debriding is um, I don't think it gets taught very well at either medical school or whatever school you go to. Um, a lot, some people are better to riders than others, um, and it's yeah difficult to teach. And um, we have one man's version of a debridement; it's not the same as the next doctor's. Yeah, yeah, and I suppose the debridement itself, the challenges compared to typical uh, wound debridement in your general practice, because of the mechanisms of the injury being, you know. The, the type that they are, the damage that's done alongside it, the intimal damage that you talked about, maybe that's something that obviously will affect beyond the actual site of the wound that you're seeing. It's it's something much further beyond. Could yeah, be with... because of you get, when you get um, hit with a say um, a bullet, you get cavitation. So there's a, a momentary expansion of the of the um, the cavity. And that stretches the tissues and it creates a lot of undermined, irregular wounds. So, and we've already talked about the huge microbial load that they're going to get. The, so they end up with a lot of soft tissue strippings. They, um, and the, the, you end up with wounds that exude a lot, a lot of exudate and a lot of odour. Yeah. And one of the things that um, we found crucial in uh, a real game changer in the management of um, of um, these combat wounds at the field hospital level was the um, uh, introduction of negative pressure wound therapy to these wounds because it really were able us to control the exudate and get rid of the odor and get rid of the cross contamination because patients were getting contaminated um, at, when the, when they were in the hospital and when they were getting and when they were being transported back to the plane they were all, there was a lot of cross contamination going on. Um, but if you want to have an MPWT on, the wound's isolated, um, and all the exudate is going to is going to be controlled. And you're using that uh, to granulate up the wound for your next stage of essentially. Well, um, certainly, certainly, it's a holding procedure until the next surgery, which hopefully will be. Um, it's either going to be another debridement or it's going to be wound closure, um, depending on whether more debridement is needed. But certainly, if in, it also aids in does it does create granulation tissue if that in, um, is an aim for um, getting your wound closed. Right. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. And uh, in terms of sort of strategies for managing that patient once, so once they've had that, uh, for instance, you're talking about the fish skin technology. Once they've had that, you're wrapping them up. You're dressing them for typically how long before you you're checking them again. Well, usually you want to. Take, we usually take them back every forty-eight hours to see to go and see has the wound um, extended anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, the problem is you might not have the luxury of um, regular. We call these take backs. So regular take backs because you you might be overwhelmed, and if you have a true mass casualty uh, situation, that is where you um, have insufficient. 
medical resources to give everyone the kind of care that you would like to give. Mm. And that might be the situation in, 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 a, in a military setting. Right, great. I might come over to you now, Dr. Lee, and then we'll talk a little bit about wound care for veterans, um, basically looking at all the challenges faced by veterans, physical and psychological, and looking at that comprehensive care approach, I guess, that the VA system provides for you um, in that. Right. So by the time I get to see a, a patient, they are no longer acute. They're they're chronic. They've had a time period for when they're in an active military and then they come to see me. So it's it's not a quick transition. I'm seeing the chronic long-term effects. So what is the significance of providing care to these veterans with combat-related injuries and limb loss, right? Because these are long-term effects now in the, the health system. So the VA has a, um, a mission and we wanna to continue to be the benchmark. We do a lot of excellence in care, value, health uh, benefits. We have all kinds of services for both patient-centered and evidence-based. We have a lot of interdisciplinary comprehensive um, care, which we involve the patient, the caregiver and the family. And there's a lot of education and training that goes into the care that we give our veterans. Um, in our, our health system here in the U.S., there's over 9 million enrolled veterans. And if you wanted to know more about the VA system, you can go to va.gov. Um, but here recently in 2020, we had a, a rather large amount of suicide deaths, 6,146, which has actually decreased from 2019. And it's higher than non-veteran suicide rates. And my understanding is that in the, the UK as well, that it's, it's, it's similar. The, it is the 13th leading cause of death among veterans. And it's the second leading cause of death among veterans under the age of 45. So su suicide and limb loss um, have a huge impact. And the, the reason why I bring up the suicide rates is that the emotional concerns after limb loss are depression, anxiety, grief, and trauma. Um, those are all emotions that be, can be overwhelming and can lead to suicidal ideation and um, possible you know, suicide. So I, I just wanted to, to bring that up as an awareness, uh, some of the problems we face in the veteran population. And let's see, let's skip ahead. So these veterans are when they come back come back from the wars and combat they are they immediately seen by the VA system that, that takes them on for the rest of their essentially healthcare needs in the future is that is that the way that it that's the way that it's set up and usually there's a, a smooth transition so if they are combat related and they're wounded in the field they go to the military hospitals first and they do their initial rehab there uh -huh. and then by the time they get to the veterans um, hospitals, it's more of the sequela of these injuries that we see or the long-term effects. So in terms of the the types of facilities they're treated in, obviously initially we've talked about being treated at the field hospital and then they're flown back. And typically in the US, are they flown back to Walter Reed or are they do they have a number of other facilities? We, we do have a, a number of facilities and one specific to limb loss, uh, we have an ease program and let's see. Walter Reed is, is one of them. And I have to look up the name. There's one in San Diego, and there's also one in, oh, I forget the name of it. No, oh, right. We so can... It's a total of uh, three of them. Yeah. Right. And they take, in... on the acute, they take on that sort of acute need for that, if they've got reconstructive um, issues that need... Uh, sorting out when they're back from war, they go to those sort of three major military centers. And then from there, they then go on to the sort of step down VA healthcare system for their long-term needs thereafter. Is that is that how it works? That is that is how it works. And so then we're, we're dealing not only with the, the challenges faced from limb loss in, in the veterans, but they're already over that acute state. So now we're dealing with the non-obvious challenges, you know, how do we integrate our veterans back into the society? How are they coping with the mental issues of combat 
these war injuries, the loss of their comrades, um, the family integration back into after being separated from um, their family, you know, their, their children, and they've missed key developmental and bonding time. Then you have the stress and strain of the, the distance of being away from their significant others. Um, so there's a huge mental and physical stress that's associated um, with, with protecting others. And they're really putting their life on the line. So the VA overall has an extensive PTSD and mental health outreach. It's probably the world's largest research and education centers for PTSD and for traumatic um, stress. They utilize a combination of psychotherapy, whether it's individualized or in group um, and medications to help with that. They have peer support uh, to confront and manage these problems. And a lot of them, they're going to be associated with chronic debilitating pain, right, from these injuries. And so we have to deal with that. So we also have some large uh, rehabilitation programs. So the, the EAST, or the Extremity Trauma and Amputation Center of Excellence, was actually um, established between the DOD and the DVA. And of course, their, their main goal is Susan may come out of the active military. To, to be that, that transition point before they get into the VA system. And they focus on the mitigation and the treatment and the rehabilitation of those traumatic um, limb injuries. And their goal is, of course, to optimize the quality of life um, for these service members. And if you really wanted to know more, you can actually go to health.mil um, and you can read about these centers. So there's, in the US, there's about 30,000 DOD beneficiaries uh, that have some type of limb loss and dysfunction from them. So Walter Reed, as you, as you mentioned, is, is a big site for us. Uh, Center for Intrepid actually um, is that Brooke Army Medical Center. And then there's the Comprehensive Combat and Complex Casualty Care Center, which is at the Naval Medical Center in San Diego for us. And then both the VA and the DOD, they have, um, multiple research institutes which are, are designing technology and prosthetics, exoskeletons, um, and these devices that are allowing them to return to, to function. And these centers are always improving the design, the a way to make them more functional, whether they have better range of motion, they're lighter, they're less cumbersome, and they're constantly adapting for, for sports so they can reintegrate at a more you know, normal level. And the, the pain we, we mentioned is a focus. It's a, um, we've had some huge advances in pharmacological management, integration and in medicine approaches that are not maybe traditional. So we have battlefield acupuncture, you know, we do pain psychology. And of course, um, like most pain centers, there's some type of uh, minimally invasive procedures, you know, nerve stem cryotherapy, neuromodulators, light therapy that, that we'll do to, to help these veterans get through with, with their pain. Is there, a, obviously, there's a balance between having um, strong evidence for care uh, to provide for the military um, veterans, but then I guess there's also a balance of trying to bring innovation and trying to bring new products and new technologies to try and help them with these in, sometimes intractable problems. Um, how is it that in the VA health system, is there a little bit of um, bit of flexibility in conducting and trials for new kind of innovations or how does that work compared to obviously uh, going through the the normal healthcare system in the US where obviously coding and reimbursements etc is there like a different pathway to to bring innovative products into that VA system from your experience yes the the VA system um, is is not like the private sector the goal is to get our patients what we need at the time they need it um, regardless of those other hurdles or barriers that you have to have from the private insurance companies. So if I need a product, if I need a fish graft, or, you know, I need an anticoagulation um, dressing scenario or, or a prosthetic device, I pretty much just ask for it and I can get it for my patients. Unlike in the battlefield where you're limited to resources in the VA system, the resources seem to be unlimited. If there's a new product out there that hasn't gone through um, 
all the commercial layers that it needs to do to be commercially available, but it's out there and it's, it's approved for use and there's some type of benefit that the patient can have, then the VA will allow it to, to, to come in. There are some hurdles as far as um, payment issues being on contract, but a, a lot of those can be overlooked, especially if there's a product that's out there that's beneficial and there's nothing that's like it. There are pathways to, to get these products on board. You mentioned um, research, um, getting products in ease. It's not an issue. It's similar to commercial research. Um, getting those products that are very early um, into the, the facility is, is not an issue for us. It's a really interesting system because I suppose uh, Prof. Jeffrey in the UK it would be, is it slightly different in terms of, would imagine we'd have to use the products that were the NHS that were on the NHS kind of formulary or approved for usage, would there be? Uh, well, now that we've left the EU, uh, there's an opportunity for, you know, we, we're so, the, the, um, we've left the EU regulatory framework. Um, so there is a, a potential for the UK, the, the MHRA, to be more agile in allowing um, new um, technologies in. Um, at an earlier stage rather than um, in, in the EU with the MDR. Um, uh, there's, there's, we, can, I, can I just go back to the pain issue? Yes. Um, that we, that um, um, uh, Dr. Lee was um, highlighting there. So, we, what, so what happens is, you, you, they are, certainly in the UK and US, they get um, a, uh, they, they're given a fentanyl log, um, lollipop or lozenge um, and um, they um, they're going to take these you know who's not who, who doesn't want to take some fentanyl for free you know um, they, so they, they're getting they straight away they're getting hooked on they're getting started on a strong opiate and then they um, they continue to get opiates throughout their um, clinical course and then what we're seeing and and uh, um, Dr. Lee will be able to speak more about this than I am, than I can. But in the US, particular, they're having problems with opiate dependency and um, misuse, and um, um, and people dying from opiate overdose. Um, veterans, so it is a problem. So uh, to to address that, um, there there is a product that's, that's coming out. We we're we're just doing the first in man trials on it now, and it's a oh, it's a, a product which it's a local anaesthetic product. Which you can spray onto your wound. It's called medisulfan. So it's got local anaesthetic. It's also got a cetramide, which is an, uh, an antimicrobial, and it's um, got adrenaline in there. And the idea is that um, you or your buddy will spray this onto the wound and it'll be opiate sparing. So perhaps you might not need to take that opiate hit and you might not, therefore, go along that um, pathway of getting addicted to it. And pain is a fun, pain is the funny thing. If you if you don't experience pain from the beginning, then um, your course, your clinical course, will be a lot smoother. It's when you when things are painful. That's the these are the patients that have the complications because their life is miserable with pain. Whereas if you can nip it in the bud early on, then um, you don't get this vicious circle of pain causing anxiety and anxiety causing pain. So hopefully in the future. Um, conflicts, um, pain will be much less of an issue. So at the moment in combat, so would a soldier carry with them those fentanyl yeah. lollies? They've got them in their yeah. pack, oh, I yeah. see. Yeah. It used to be a morphine autojet, so right. you would inject yourself in the thigh, but um, the fentanyl is a lot quicker acting and also there's a lot less can go wrong because I've seen people with and done the autojet and then injected the morphine into their thumb, you know, that's not the thing the wrong way around. <laughs> um, so, so, yeah, a lot less of them scope things going wrong uh, with the pencil. And, and the thing is, see, as you get drowsier, and you should suck on the lollipop less, you know, so yeah. you stop getting yourself the dose. So I don't know if Dr. Lee wanted to comment on that. Well, obviously, I'm I'm not seeing them there in the field when they're sucking on these lollipops. When they come in, they they generally do have chronic pain issues. So the ones that I'm seeing, um, 
that will have some type of post-traumatic arthritis or it would be limb loss, pain related to that. And yes, it's, it is an issue um, in the U.S. And it's not necessarily that it's the, the patients or our veterans who are taking the, the pain medicine, but it's the people taking it out of their bathroom and then using it and as abusing it as well, um, which is contributing to this whole um, pandemic um, opiate crisis that we're, we're having. The VA actually started a pretty um, nice program of naloxone, giving that to all patients who go on these, these pain meds to hopefully reverse and avoid any overdose scenarios. Um, they're doing a lot of literature and like research on that. And we're saving lives by doing that. Um, we have extensive research programs as well into the pain, trying to help them deal with these chronic scenarios. And because of the, the whole epidemic, trying to wean everyone off pain meds and not give them more, more is, is challenging as well. Because if they're sucking on the lollipops and they don't have pain in the, in the field, when they come see us, I mean, they've been using it for a long time and, and trying to wean them off of it is a, a huge challenge that our, our primary care and our pain clinics are, are dealing with now. And the patients have anxiety over when they're going to have the next next pain pill or if they're going to have pain and they have a hard time dealing um, socially um, in work environments because of that. And that also becomes debilitating and it's, it's a huge issue for society. Yeah. And actually, you know, when, when we were reviewing the mechanisms of these um, military injuries, they are, they're painful injuries, aren't they? They're high velocity injuries. There's disruption of the neural networks, etc. cetera. So um, it must be very hard for you on that front line of trying to deal with um, actual pain versus obviously the, the increased use of opioids, because it must be really hard to try and deny uh, analgesia to obviously that group, which, you know, will have that neuralgia, will have all the CRPS, I can't remember what it's called now. <laughs> yeah, the modern name for it. Um, but, you know, complex regional pain, et cetera. So yeah, it's a real challenge. So you're going to talk to us a little bit about disease-related deaths compared to battle-related deaths. Is that right, Dr. Lee? Yes. And so a, com a problem that we have or that we share between um, the military, you know, civilian ward and the veteran population is multi-drug resistant organisms. So I, I thought I touched on that as it pertains to timeframes and wars and kind of show the relevance of how antibiotics has been playing with our, our wound care. Um, so if you look at this slide, it's the ratio of disease related deaths to battle related deaths. Um, so it's a growing problem um, related to wounds and it really makes antibiotic stewardship um, ever more challenging and ever more important. I don't know about you guys, but everywhere I turn, you know, they're always talking about antibiotic stewardship when we're trying to prescribe an antibiotic in our facility. Um, so it really wasn't until World War I that the battlefield deaths reached parity with disease-related deaths. Um, and this comes from improvements in surgical management of wounds, which actually led to the gradual disappearance of clostridium-associated gas gangrene. So the ratio was um, seven to one for the French Revolutionary and Napoleonic Wars, Mexican War, Spanish-American War as, as well. And then when we got to World War I, the, with the new techniques, the gas gangrene incident went from 5% and then a 28% mortality rate. As we go through time to the next war, World War II, gas gangrene incidence was now only 1.5% with a 15% mortality rate. And by the time we got to the Korean War, the incidence was 0 0.08 with no mortality. Um, so that was a, a, a huge win. Come time for World War II, um, sulfonamide powder was actually used and it was just sprinkled or dumped into, into wounds. And then of course in late 1942, then we have the penicillin use. Um, the, the British were using it to sterilize their wounds and the US was given it systemically. Go to my next slide here. So I kind of put together this, this timeline to show what kind of advances we had with time and our antibiotic use that's contributing to this, this, this problem that we're seeing. So Korean War resistance, uh, we started seeing antibiotic resistance there. So I, I mentioned in World War II, we had um, improvement in our surgical management of wounds. 
World War II, then we have started using masks. We have more sterilization of instruments that we weren't doing prior. We have infection control practices that we weren't doing prior. We have increase in antibiotic use, um, penicillins and sulfamidolides. When we look at the Korean War, now we start to have helicopter evacuation and, and surgical hospitals. And you, you've already touched on this a little bit earlier and how that's made a difference um, in healing our, our military guys. But at this time frame, we start seeing resistant bacteria. I told you they were just dumping powder into wounds. Well, they were giving penicillin um, and streptomycin wound prophylaxis. And about three to five days after these wound injuries, they were starting to see resistant strains. By the time we got to the Afghanistan war, um, we have a lot of hemostatic agents now that we, we were using on the field. We'd have tourniquets um, and the, the early kind of aggressive debridement that you were just talking about, if, if you're able to do it, uh, was the preference and that made a difference. So the Korean War resistant strains were from likely the inadequate debridement and then giving prophylactic antibiotics um, to lead to this increase in drug resistance. For the Afghan and Iraq timeframe, the early aggressive debridement, holding back broad spectrum antibiotics and waiting for the culture driven results made a difference um, in that resistant strains. We kind of slowed it down some. There's been studies where they've looked at which strains, you know, do you see this drug resistance in over time? And in the U.S. troops, um, it's the typical staph and, and strep. Usually um, staphylococcal infections are higher than the staph aureus and the strep being, being the least. But that's the kind of the top, top three. When we looked um, into data, now that, you know, we're collecting data, we're, we're looking at these EMRs and we have all these databases. Um, open fractures in Iraq, when they took deep cultures, um, the study is referenced on the bottom here, but 27 out of 35 of these deep cultures had reoccurrent infections over and over again with staph and was associated with delayed unions or amputations, uh, which can be very devastating, right, for our, our veterans. They had resistant gram negatives in there. Um, the interesting thing that they found, though, in Iraq was that these, these multi-drug resistant organisms were not found at the time of the actual injury. And they were actually acquired um, in hospitals or overseas um, environments. So not necessarily at the time of the injury. So this is where the importance comes in of universal um, protection and cleaning hands you know, just the, the good infection control practices. Of course, in Afghanistan, right, the blast trauma um, that, that they seen there, it was actually associated with invasive fungal wound infections, um, so much so that they, they had a task force dedicated to figuring out how to, to deal with these fungal wound infections. The conflicts in, in the Middle East, um, they've actually had a chance to look at civilian that were wounded and war wounds at the time of conflict. So not active military, right? So this is how war affects others. And they saw a lot, an increase in the, the drug resistance. And it's likely due to the delay access to wound care, um, previous use of antibiotics without culture, uh, because they didn't have access, you know, they, they couldn't get resources in, or maybe they had a shelter in place and it wasn't a good time to seek care for those wounds. And then when it was safe to do so, you know, they did. So these, these chronic conditions um, can lead to osteomyelitis, um, malunions, nonunions, and those things can lead to amputation and limb loss. Um, so not only in our veterans, but in the civilian counterparts as well. And of course, active military. So I did a little dig because um, I was I was curious on the evolution of these multi-drug resistant organisms. And I know the DOD is, is doing a lot of research into this as well, because we're running out of antibiotics, right? All these drug resistance that are that are coming up. So there was a study here recently published in, in 2022 
And they looked at non-specific to military, but weapon wounded civilians. Um, and they had a huge database and they found that, well, I, mean, I, should, I guess I should go back. There were 627 patients who were admitted with these injuries and they had, what was it? 1,149 positive cultures. 348 of these cultures had bone involvement. And then the remainder was skin and soft tissue for these multi-drug resistant isolates. You can see the, the representation of, of where the, the cultures were from. And these are in, in young, healthy um, individuals that were having these, these resistant strains. So they still have the rest of their life to go through carrying this type of burden, right? The most common isolates was Staph aureus, um, you know, there's Enterobacterios, Pseudomonas, Enterococci, a bunch of, of organisms that, that cause problem. They found that though, the Staph aureus isolates, the presence of MRSA was associated with the actual site of where they took the culture. And the odds ratio was two times more likely to be in the bone than in soft tissue or skin infections. And we all know how bone infections go, right? Um, they also found that the enterobacterialis um, strains that were resistant were mostly in males, in bone, and those from Syria. I thought it was interesting that when they looked at Pseudomonas, um, it didn't really matter in any of those areas. There was, there was no relationship for the resistance. And then when you combined all the multi-drug resistant isolates that they found in these, these non-veterans, 72.6% of them were from Syria, but Iraq had the highest proportion of MDRs at 85.2%. So I, I thought that was pretty interesting. The odds ratio of a multi-drug resistant isolate is 5.9 times higher in patients from Iraq compared to Syria. Oh. And the odds ratio for, um, for bone than soft tissue or not, yeah, was 59% higher. So the difference in military versus civilian isolates um, most likely is due to the timeliness and the quality of care at the time of injury for those. And then you, you actually touched on Ukraine being an issue, right? Uh, so papers are starting to emerge from the Russian-Ukraine war. And by all means, this data is preliminary. We don't, we don't have all the numbers. But there is a large emergence of these multi-drug resistant organisms um, seen in the Netherlands in patients who have originated from Ukraine. So half of these patients report prior hospitalization um, in Ukraine. Now, normally Netherlands is a country with very low prevalence of N NDRs. But starting in March, for migration of people from Ukraine and then medical evacuation from their hospitals, um, there's been an uptake. And prior um, to the war, Ukraine actually had a rise in multi-drug resistance, I think like the US as well. And they found that there was a higher rate of force in their, their military counterparts in the civilian hospitals. And I thought it was interesting that the CDC actually um, advises people or hospital settings, I should say, that people with traumatic wounds that are coming from Ukraine very well might have a drug resistant strain and they want preemptive isolation and screening for those individuals to try to help spread that or stop spreading it. So multi-drug resistance is, is, is not just combat wounds nor civilian related wound wars, although there appears to be a higher incidence. Um, as the active military start to transition back to the, the civilian population, you know, after completing their, their tour of duty, um, they carry these problems into the, the VA medical centers. And these conditions, instead of being acute, they're now chronic, they're multifactorial, um, they're compounded now with, with age um, and other related medical problems. Um, so it's, it's, it's really challenging sometimes to, to treat these individuals. Um, and the veterans, you know, they, they continue to carry the cost of, of freedom beyond their, their years of service. And by all means, I am definitely grateful for anyone who, who spends time in the service. I mean, they've, they've definitely gone through a lot and they continue to go through it throughout their life. It doesn't stop when they, um, they finish. 
Thank you very much, Dr. Lee. I mean, it's just been a real eye opener of, you know, hearing about obviously the from the mechanisms of these injuries to see, you know, there's such high velocity contaminated wounds with cavitation, etc. But not only that, I think you've really, you know, shone the light on the other injuries that they get, you know, in terms of osteomyelitis and um, bone issues long term, uh, these long term fractures, which may have non union, those uh, veterans have ended up with amputations. I mean, uh, it might be a short military tour that they they have in any of these conflict zones. But really, as you said, that price of the price of the damage could just it goes on, doesn't it for, for decades until the, the last days, really, there's such long term issues, whereas we very much sort of think about military wounds, right, this is what's happened, there'll be an amputation, and then that'll be, you know, very much we think in that along those terms of short term solutions. But you right, know, but it's not a short term solution, right? It's, it's a long term problem, because then they have to deal with all the factors once they come back home, or when they try to integrate into society, whether they can or cannot work, yeah. and how that impacts impacts what they're doing going forward with their life, their so expectations. We look at we're looking at literally just a very small percentage of all their problems by looking at their wound and long term health issues. Actually, there's a whole layer of psychological and social disruption to their lives, and you know it's it's very sad. I you know especially when you see the sort of sometimes the, the very poor quality of life that they have um, once they've, you know, dedicated the service to, to their country is that that price that they pay is above and beyond, isn't it? In terms of uh, complications and any semblance of a, of a normal getting back to normal life is, is near impossible from obviously the, the data that you've shown. And you also, we had this discussion earlier, didn't we, about Agent Orange? So yeah, we'd love to hear a bit more about that. So I, I just wanted to touch on this because it's it's something that we see common um, in the VA system right now. So combat-related injuries are, are not the only problem that our, our veterans face when they're in the service. So many of them are actually exposed to harmful chemicals that have immediate and lifelong debilitating consequences, right? So Agent Orange, um, is a chemical. It was a herbicide. It was used as a depolant during um, Vietnam by the U.S. military. It would knock the leaves off of trees or it could wipe out a whole crop field. So if you wanted to, to have certain um, group of people move out of an area or see if they're hiding, um, this chemical allowed you to do that. However, it caused a whole host of long-term effects for, for the people who were involved, who touched it, who came in contact with it. Um, so anyone, I believe in the veteran, uh, Vietnam, the Korean demilitarized zone, um, transport of these, these chemicals. And I think in some of the Thailand bases had some type of level of exposure or could have had exposure to the chemical. It, it causes cancer, various different types, other problems. But the reason I bring it up because we're talking about wounds, is that it actually causes type two diabetes and peripheral neuropathy. And we all, I think, are familiar with what happens uh, with diabetic foot wounds, right? Um, and, and how that, that goes forward and plays out. So it's like the gift that keeps giving, right? So for these, these Vietnam veterans, um, I should say in our veteran population, about 5% are actually have diabetes. Um, so with diabetes, you know, 33% of these patients go on to have ulcers, half of them become infected, wounds can last for 12 weeks to 13 months or more, that varies widely depending on the patient, um, they can remain open, they might never heal, you know, 22%, 25%, somewhere around there of DFUs end up going to amputation, so even if they do survive the war, they can, you know, get diabetes and, and then have an amputation as a consequence of the the, the diabetes. Um, so these, these wounds, whether they heal, reoccur, 60 to 70% reoccur over time, right? Um, they're, they're associated with a decreased quality of life and a significant cause of morbidity as well. Um, so we're all familiar with these, these connected medical um, conditions. They're, they're challenging in wound care uh, and they're associated with that diabetic patient population. Uh, but this is often a result of the service location exposure for these veterans um, in the Vietnam era. And, and we see that um, all the time. So it's the long-term sequela of being in the service. 
um, that, that's causing these wounds here. Mm -hmm. But unlike when they are in the, the military, um, the setting and the, on the field and it's acute, now I do have access to what I need when I need it, which definitely makes a difference. Oh, gosh. You do a really amazing job for, for this group of patients and uh, it's really, you know, admirable. So um, well done on, on all that hard work. And obviously with your research as well, you're obviously working hard to try and find better solutions uh, for this group. So um, that's, that's really fantastic. Uh, so I'd like to thank you both. So uh, Lieutenant Colonel Jeffrey, thank you for joining us for this podcast. And Dr. Eliza Lee, thank you so much for your contribution. It was a real eye opener to look at the sort of long term health problems with veterans. Uh, so look forward to doing another one of these with you again. It sounds like it was one of those topics that really was nearly impossible to cover in one episode so we do hope to dedicate some more time to uh, some of the other issues we've discussed today in a future podcast sounds wonderful thank you so much thank Appreciate you everything Enjoy the rest of your day and uh, we look forward to working with you again soon thank you thank you to all of you for watching episode five and we hope you'll join us for episode six which is going to be talking about dodging the medical legal bullets uh, in wound care practice uh, with Dr. Joseph Byrne. Thanks again. Hope you enjoy the rest of your week and see you soon.